Twitter by Ian M. Banks is my first step into the world of the culture. I've heard bits and pieces out uh, about it through a variety of other sources, from the absurd shit names to the concept of outside concept problems to the absurdly high tech level, but I'd never actually read a novel in the universe. Um, all this stuff I picked up through like general geek culture osmosis. Now, Matter is not the first book in the series by any means. It, it Gazitor Plebis is, but it is a book that I'd heard recommended as a good jumping on point to the culture series. So, figure about as well jump on here. Now, if you're going this like for more general science, if you're like a general science fiction book reading person, I'm just going to give this heads up in advance. Uh, in case you couldn't tell by like my, you know, Bit art in the background that's something i'm kind of an anime person um i haven't reviewed as much anime on the channel video wise as i would normally but i'm i'm a bit of an anime fan so i tend to contextualize science fiction and that sort of thing oftentimes through for literary science fiction often through japanese animation also often the other way around because i've read plenty of si literary science fiction as well so keeping that in mind matter has two main narrative threads that come together in sort of a very twisty kind of rapid escalation um, OVA anime ending. Not quite a Gynax ending sort of situation, but very much like in the sense of like Evangelion or the Big O or Lane or that sort of thing, but more kind of in the sense of a, for, of like a gun buster sort of um, escalation in more than a few respects. And the story is set on the world of Cersimen. It is a shell world. It's a planet filled with a whole variety of concentric structures all the way down to some sort of core. Often, some of these structures will have civilizations of their own, of their own varying tech levels. This is not, and it's, a, it's more planet-sized than being something like a Dyson Sphere. And it's one which has interaction with various other higher tech worlds some of those high tech civilizations serving as mentor races to mentor races to civilizations on this one and the book sets up that there have been about you know 4000 shell worlds in the galaxy but half of them have been destroyed under mysterious circumstances which is why there's more intervention going on in this world now on the shell world we have the kingdom of sorrow and which at the start of the book it used to be, but is now no longer being ruled by Hausk, uh, the king. And he's no longer being ruled by, uh, he's no longer ruling the kingdom because he's been murdered and betrayed, and you know, just betrayed by one of his generals, Mertis Tyrell Losip. Hausk's son, oldest son, Furbin, is kind of a fop, has a reputation of being a generally useless person, and but he manages to barely escape being killed by Tyrell Losip himself, although Losip thinks till Losip thinks that he's succeeded in killing him. In a desperate attempt to get help, recognizing that he, with everyone thinking him dead, he uh, can't rely on anyone here. Furbin heads to the only place we can think he can go to get someone who can help him off planet, with the only retainer he can trust, Hulse, in order to seek out his sister, Dijan Serity Anaplian, who had left the planet fifteen years earlier earlier as part of a cultural exchange with the culture a massive civilized a multi-civilization amalgam civilization with ai shit with ships that are that are artificial intelligence in their own right um think of it like the federation but with a more degree of intervention to more than a few extents and also again without without the Prime Directive in the same form that uh, Starfleet has. Before leaving, um, Furbin leaves a note with his younger brother and next in line for the phone, throne, Oriman, warning him of Tyrell Losip's treachery. Um, Oriman is my younger brother. I mean, like, probably, like, mid-teens kind of situation. Like, definitely, A.L., he's going to be... Tyrell Losip is going to be regent kind of situation. Now, Furman and Hulse end up encountering, for lack of a better term, culture shock, as they encounter various high-tech civilizations on their way to their reunion to the, with, with their sister and learn a bit more about the nature of the culture. All this, of course, in the hope that she can help him save their brother and avenge their father. 
Meanwhile, Oriman, recognizing that he's now in a den of wolves, um, basically tries to, for lack of a better term, well, not just survive, but also put himself in a situation where he can hopefully reclaim his birthright and defeat and overthrow Tolosip if Furbin and Hulse don't make it. Complicating all this further is Terlosip is being backed by an alien race known as the Oct, who are seeking a mysterious artifact on the ruins of the ninth level of the Shell World, and that's that's their main focus. As far as Terlosip is concerned, as long as the Oct will help him gain dump, gain total dominion, he'll do whatever they need, and as long as they don't interfere, he's fine. Um, otherwise, he'll happily murder anyone in his way to accomplishing that goal, leading to, naturally, several assassination attempts against Oriman because, oh, he's, he, Terlosip is regent, but he's not permanent monarch, and um, Oriman will is supposed to eventually get the throne, and Terlosip will rather just have the throne. If this all, by the way, comes across as very Game of Thrones, it absolutely is. It's not as sex-heavy as Game of Thrones is. I mean, yes, yes, there is sex in the world of in the stories of the culture, but it isn't like it's not as heavy here as it is in Game of Thrones. Um, not just in terms of the television series, but even when it comes up in various chunks over the course of the books, it is a relatively minor thing here. The political machinations, both on Sursaman and ultimately involving the culture and the Oct, are much more at the forefront. Anyway, on top of all this, we also have, well, Anaplian. Now, again, Anaplian left Sursaman on a cultural exchange program and to the culture, where ultimately she decided to become a special circumstances agent for the culture. The way I describe a special circumstances agent would be like Battle Angel, would be like the Major from Ghost in the Shell, except with the body, with like the Fizzy Roy body from Battle Angel Alita Last Order. Um, that the one she's got at the end of that, that's like, can like ma do massive devastation to um, like the space station and that sort of thing. It's like if Elizabeth Bennett from Pride and Prejudice went abroad to study for a couple, several years. This is in the setting of Pride and Prejudice, like Edwardian or Regency England. But instead of just coming back more traveled and culturally literate, she also came back to Regency England, kitted out like Major Motoko Kusanagi with a Giver suit. And that gives you Anna Pleon at the start of this story, more or less. Again, probably closer to some of the to like the Berserker um, Torp body or the Physioroy body or similar upgrades that Alita gets in Battle Angel Alita than, than the Major, but you get what I drift. Um, start of the book, she's just she's just coming home on bereavement leave. She's learned her father's dead. She's coming home for the funeral. Um, she's going to, well, her father's dead, her brother's dead, she can come off the funeral pay her respects, and then she's going to return to the culture and doing special circumstances, so there's nothing left. There's very little left for her now, back home. And then she learns the Oct are up to something, and by the time she meets up with her brother and learns, um, and by her brother, I mean um, Furbin, and learns the truth, she is ready to get her John Wick on. It all makes for an interesting ride to the story as all these plot threads start hitting on their collision course, with the implication being that to use the concept of the anti the to use the outside context problem thing, um, that Anaplene is going to be an outside context problem for the people who killed her father, in the sense that these are people who are at a again, Edwardian Elizabethan not Elizabethan, but Edwardian Regency um technology level. Well, they got guns, they got swords, they may, they have um, that sort of thing. They have a moderate tech level. They may have some, some exposure to some higher tech stuff, but they are completely, utterly incapable. Like, they would be completely, utterly incapable of defending themselves against someone with the abilities of the Major. Like, sure, the Major couldn't hack her way in or anything like that because there's nothing to hack, but, you know, the 
between the stealth camouflage and the fact that her um, augmented body is probably resistant to the firearms that they'd be equipped with. Um, and maybe even, and her reflexes are faster than anything that they have. She just, she could make mincemeat of a whole army, that sort of thing. And then the final act of the story, without spoiling anything further, um, the context of the ruins are opened and an entirely different outside context problem shows up. And one that's been lightly foreshadowed when you get to the half of these shell worlds have been destroyed a bit earlier. And it makes sense in context of what it is. And like in terms of that, that there is something like this here and the fundamental concept of understanding what it is more or less. But at that point, everything just goes into ludicrous speed. Now, I've watched plenty of 90s OVA series where everything just in the last episode just goes zoom. We're like, OK, we need to have a big, flashy um, spectacle showcase to the to have for the conclusion and the finale, and this is definitely that. Um, that said, not everybody rolls with that, particularly for more, if you're a fan of more recent anime, I, I do recall some part of the pushback against Darling and the Franks being all of us, being the all of a sudden we're in space, and then all of a sudden we're now just Die Buster 3, I guess? Um, or, or an extended die buster and gun buster homage, I guess. And a lot of people, a lot, we were hearing a lot of people bouncing off of that. There's plenty of other reasons that people bounced off of it, but those were ones that I, a high profile example that's relevant given the circumstances. Um, and also, I could honestly see that this spectacle being something that works for a person much better in a visual form, any sort of visual form, comics, animation, video games, movies, television, whatever, but not show, not so much in prose. And basically said, or maybe even be like, okay, in a light novel, it's prose with illustrations. So we like, so when you get a moment like this, you have an illustration to kind of give you a visual internal context and not having that here, similarly causing you to bounce off. And that could definitely be the case for some people, some readers for this. Also, honestly, like some older anime, there is not a lot of denouement to speak of. It's not quite at your 70s Shaw Brothers, we've beaten the enemy and then the, the boss, and then it just ends. You get a little bit, but it's less pronounced. It's like the novel equivalent of a post credit stinger. And I could see some people just straight up missing it, particularly since it comes after an appendices. It'd be like... It'd be like if in The Lord of the Rings, if we had the scene in The Grey Havens with, uh, Bilbo, with uh, Bilbo and Frodo and Gandalf and all of them leaving to go into the West and you stuck that after the appendices, after all that big chunk of exposition about the history of Middle Earth and the brazen which, and the, the bits that are relevant and some of the stuff that came after and that sort of thing. And now you get, Oh, Ed, here's, here's what finally actually the final results of, or the final fates of Frodo and Bilbo. And Gandalf and that sort of thing. So I could see that the people was missing here, like, oh, hitting the appendices and going, okay, I'm done. And then just closing the book and stopping. Or similarly, because they do, Banks did something like that in the first book in the series, which I, I finished reading and will review later. Um, in in Gazer Plebis, we get a similar little bit of fiction at the end of an appendix, basically the appendices. But even that one is... It's not as narratively significant as the one in this one. It's much more... In, like, it's That one, it's very short. It's a nice little moment, but not that important. 
in it's a complete business. This is the fate of two different significant characters in the story, and we find out what happens to them when their fates are left completely up in the air when the book technically actually stops, or rather, when the main narrative stops and we hit the appendices. And so then, if you've read Gets Under Plebis, you hit the appendix, go, oh, there may be fiction after the end of the appendix, but it's not going to be a big deal. I can skip it. Uh, but in this case, it's more important. This, this is more of a Marvel movie, watch the credits sort of situation. But in all, I enjoyed the book. I am glad that I got around to finishing it and that I, also, again, honestly think this is a solid introduction to the culture. Much better than, having read the first book, it is much better than Consider Plebis. Honestly, if I had been suggesting which culture book to go with for the Sword and Laser, I would have gone with this one over Consider Plebis. You can come... You're not missing anything. Consider Plebis is not somehow mis uncomprehensible by going back to this one, go by reading that one after reading this one. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.